to the League of Women Voters Meet the Candidate Forum, produced in collaboration with WTJX-TV, our partner for over 20 years in bringing these programs to the voters of the Virgin Islands. My name is Denise Singleton, a member of the League, and I will serve as the moderator for today's forum. It is our goal that you, the voting public will become better acquainted with the candidates for political office in the Virgin Islands and therefore be able to make informed choices at the polls in November. We are pleased to have as our guest today two candidates for a seat in the 32nd legislature. Senator Narita O'Reilly, a Democratic candidate, and Senator Positive T.A. Nelson, an independent citizens movement candidate. The candidates have been informed in advance of the format for the program. Each will have 60 seconds for an introductory statement and 60 seconds for closing remarks. Questions of major interest to the public will be presented by the moderator. No candidate has been provided with these questions in advance of the program. The first respondent will be rotated among the candidates. The first responder will have two minutes for a response to a question, with the other participant having one minute to contribute or to challenge. Now for the introductory statements starting with Senator O'Reilly. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Denise. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers, the uh, League of Women Voters and WTJX for having me here this morning. It's a pleasure uh, to offer myself again to the people of St. Croix as their candidate um, to serve in the 32nd legislature. I look forward to the questions and I look forward to a very robust uh, and a significant conversation throughout this forum. Thank you. Senator Nelson. Hi, uh, good day. I'm happy to be here. I want to thank the League of Women Voters for your invitation. I am Positive T.A. Nelson, a six-term senator here in the St. Croix District. I'm offering myself once again to the, uh, as a candidate to the 32nd legislature. I consider myself experienced, having a heart for the people, having a vision for St. Croix and the Virgin Islands, and I'm asking you, the public, to remember me on election day. I am number two on the ballot, and I want to continue offering progressive legislation here in the territory, and I look forward to the discussion and the questions. We're going to uh, <clears throat> next go to back to Senator Nelson, and we're going to give you two minutes to, ex to talk about what major accomplishments you have made over the past two years on behalf of the people of the VI that would justify your reelection. Uh, thank you very much. It's hard to talk about major accomplishments when we find ourselves still in the conditions that we are. I've, I've offered a voice of reason. I've offered legislation. It's not yet passed, uh, Bill 4031. Uh, there's uh, 0235, the Infrastructure Reconstruction Plan, which I believe will be the economic turnaround for a long time to come. I believe it's necessary to improve our infrastructure so we can uh, sustain the growth that we're talking about. Unless we have affordable electricity, uh, a dependable, portable water, and decent roads, it's hard to talk about growth. But I have offered legislation which is uh, authorized for industrial hemp, which I believe it will, will be a, a key uh, revenue generator here, and that was passed. That's Act uh, 7868. I have offered legislation. It was passed for the Public Officials Compensation Commission that is taking the politics out of how public officials are paid. There is legislation, which I'm very proud of, which expands the protection for individuals who want to file a restraining order or for harassment. You no longer have to be in a domestic relationship in order to file such. Uh, I've offered and legislation which gives appropriations to various organizations and entities here in the territory. Uh, but again, I believe what is my asset in, in asking to, for another term in the legislature is me being a reasonable voice, being able to, to get a grasp of the situation and offer resolutions to uh, moving forward. I believe that 
I've been an anchor in the storm, and I'm asking the people to give me another go at it. I still have fight in me, and I'm, I think in these critical times, you need critical thinkers, which I am. Again, I am your candidate, positive T.A. Nelson, number two on the ballot. Senator O'Reilly, <coughs> one minute. Yeah, thank you very much. I am, um, one minute? I have, <laughs> I am uh, very pleased to have joined my colleague on many of his measures, and no man is an island. Uh, as a senator, you not only have your own measures that you uh, want to push, and uh, the initiatives that you believe are important for the, your constituent, but then you also have to be open to the measures that are offered by those that uh, you serve alongside. Uh, I am particularly proud of the Garvey bond. It was an authorization. Uh, of $250 million, of which $100 million have already been floated for the repair of roads in the territory. More than 55% of that, uh, of whatever sum is floated, uh, will be spent in the district of St. Croix to repair uh, our roads and to build better infrastructure uh, for the residents of this island. Let's talk a little bit about budget. The budget recently developed is significantly larger than many before and is based on assuming significant debt. <clears throat> it appears to us in the League that there is little in the way of stimulating economy in the budget. Please address this concern of the League regarding the seemingly weak revenue generating character of the budget to generate funds that will stay in the territory. And that's for me? That's for you. <laughs> Very well. Uh, so I don't want to talk about, about what the problems are. We all are very familiar with the problems. I think that what's critical is for us to talk about how we are going to build a stronger economy for the territory. And we all can agree that small businesses really are the engine that turn the wheels of economic development. Uh, and that has to begin with, first of all, creating a synergy. Uh, between all of the other economic development programs that already exist, by way of example, the EDA, uh, utilization of the industrial complex um, at the, on, the, on the highway, uh, the Hotel Development Act, the uh, Banking Entities Act that was passed recently, uh, as well as the VINGN and the RT Park. Uh, these are all uh, economic development engines that if work, if we can put them to work together, will create the economic growth that we all want to see. Um, I have a measure that uh, is going to allow for a creation of a venture capital fund, a revolving fund that will be funded in part by the EDC companies that come to the territory and benefit from significant tax subsidies. Uh, the, the, uh, the reason for the venture capital fu uh, fund would be to help entrepreneurs, local entrepreneurs, uh, individuals who want to, uh, to find funding for startups, uh, to fund those uh, activities, to finance those startups, uh, and to help build the, the small business sector so that we can create jobs uh, and we can build a stronger economy for all. I believe that we need to put uh, our trust and confidence in small businesses because that is what really keeps uh, moving our, our engine forward. Thank you. Senator Nelson. Thank you. We need to be deliberate in, in when we are appropriating monies. The entities that generate revenue, we need to make sure that they're properly funded and staffed so they can continue to increase their revenue generation. The budget, I, won't, I do not agree with you that the budget is, is significantly larger. The budget is similar to what it's been. Our budget is about $1.2 billion, about $750, $760 million of that is local funds. So it's not significantly larger. I do believe, however, we got to be using our borrowed monies to be more of a stimulant to the economy in, in starting some, uh, getting a better return on investment, starting some entrepreneurship, starting some uh, uh, small business loans where they can uh, sort of refinance themselves and hold to these hard times. I agree with my colleague that uh, small business is the way to go and you must make sure that they can sustain themselves during these hard economic times while we improve the infrastructure to ensure that we have affordable utilities, electricity, water, internet, etc. Sticking with the budget, Senator Nelson, you have long proposed the legalization of marijuana for medicinal purposes. What kinds of safeguards would you propose for the cultivation and distribu uh, distribution of the plant for such purposes? 
Uh, thank you very much for the question. There are many models to follow. There are some 23 states who have legalized cannabis in their, ter in their jurisdictions. The regulatory, there's usually a regulatory board similar to an alcohol, a, a tobacco control board, which will going to be created here in the territory to be the regulator for the system. You, no one can just approach a dispensary, a dispensary for medicinal purposes. You're going to have a card in order to have access to such. In order to grow for uh, medicinal purposes, you're going to have to be proper licensed and permitted. This is not a free for all. Some of my colleagues have uh, agreed that they might be interested in what they call 420 zones. That is where certain commercial districts, they want to allow for dispensaries for adult use. I, the bill does not contemplate adult use at this time. Uh, but for, for me, medicinal cannabis is, is, is a highly regulated industry because we're talking about a, a, a health commodity. It's important that the medicines are, are pure of, of any uh, pesticides and other contaminants. And all, all product that is going out to the market has to be lab tested, and that's what's good about this. Right now, there are people experimenting with medicinal cannabis, but the product they're using, uh, they do not know the content because there is not a legal uh, 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 industry right now, especially here in the territory. There are many individuals who have utilized cannabis over the years medicinally. But now that the science has caught up with what has been what is called anecdotal testimonies, uh, now we are ready to say and prove that cannabis is in fact an important asset as it relates to uh, health medicines. There's something in your body I want for you to research. It's called the endocannabinoid system. It's in your human body. It's, a, it's an immune system in the human body. And cannabis, I believe, will also generate a lot of economic activity because our, our destination would also it would add to the ambience of our destination as it relates to uh, health in the region. Um, I support it. I'm strongly behind it. And I believe that's the way to go. Thank you. Senator General Riley. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. This is where my colleague and I disagree, I strongly disagree. Uh, I believe that the measure that has been uh, presented before the Senate uh, goes too far, um, almost as if it um, could be interpreted as a legalization bill. I believe that the, the, the science and the research is not conclusive uh, as to the benefits of uh, cannabis, particularly in smoking uh, form. Uh, I am very concerned that it would expand use uh, among young people. And I believe that there are many other ways in which we can try to uh, re-energize our economy and bring in the tax revenues that we need to sustain our, our government and the residents of this territory without risking um, the, the, the health uh, and the well-being of our young people. Can I rebut? Certainly. Uh, the, the, the data has already proven that places where legalization is, there's not been an increase in usage. As a matter of fact, the data has proven that there's been a decrease. And as it relates to uh, ca medical cannabis for smoking, smoking cannabis is the least healthy way to use it. It is not suggested to use cannabis, smoking cannabis medicinally. It's used usually in tinctures, rubs, other types of ointments. But uh, it's understanding the history, and please do read the bill. It's 31 that's 0348. It's clear. I thank you. And it's also clear that the bill does allow, allow for the smoking of the, of the plant. Okay. I disagree. Okay. Let's move on then to public safety. Do you think we need to have a change in our gun control laws as a measure to reduce crime? If so, what changes would you propose? If not, what would you do as a senator to con control the proliferation of guns in the VI? And we'll begin with you, Senator. Sure, Rowe. thank you for the question. Uh, I, I think it's, it's a critical for people to understand that the Virgin Islands has perhaps <laughs> some of the strongest legislation or statutes that address gun control and gun violence. Um, we also have to recognize that we are a territory surrounded by water and that our waters are protected uh, not by us but by the federal government. And so that customs, our borders, how people bring in trailers and, and, um, and how they enter our waterways and our air is controlled by the federal government. I believe uh, that it's unfortunate that right now guns can come to the territory either through uh, boats or airplanes without the proper mechanisms in place to inform law enforcement agencies that these guns are coming in. We do not manufacture guns in the territory. So we need to be cognizant of the fact that they're coming in through other uh, avenues. I believe that it's time for us to hold the federal government 
uh, accountable for the protection of our borders, uh, that we have a conversation with the federal government uh, to uh, require that they enhance uh, our border uh, and, and the patrolling and, and the control of those who come into our borders. And then, and then finally, uh, I think it's really critical for us to deal with our education, our public education uh, system so that we can open opportunities and create jobs for our young people. Uh, I don't want to make excuses for the reason why people uh, seek a life of crime, but clearly no one is born wanting to be uh, a criminal. No, no one is born um, desiring to, to, to lead a life um, that, that, that leads to pain uh, and heartache. Everyone should be given an opportunity for success, and that opportunity can only be, be given to individuals through the uh, enhancement of our education system. I don't believe that uh, laws and paper can stop the influx of guns. We, as was mentioned, we have the strongest gun laws perhaps in the nation. We have to work on changing the mindset of our young people. Right? We need to get in their heads. I don't think they need another law to be written or changed. Right? We're making it harder for the honest citizen to own a gun. Criminals do not care about the laws, so when you make it harder for the homeowner and the business owner to protect themselves and their business, you're making it open season for the criminals. I do agree that uh, the American government has more responsibility with our border protection. We've seen recently where individuals have brought in guns to the airport and they have not declared the guns and we need to hold the airlines accountable as well. And yes, our delegate to Congress needs to get on the ball in ensuring that American dollars are sent down here to ensure that we can uh, shore up our, our borders. We have open borders all around. So I would go that approach. Opportunities, uh, monitoring, and of course enforcement. If I may add, I, I think it's cr critical for us to also use this opportunity to educate um, the, the listening and viewing um, audience. And recently we passed legislation that um, is going to uh, inform us when guns are coming in um, through the airports. Uh, I think that we need to also find the funding to put in metal detectors uh, at the airports and all suitcases, all luggage that comes through should be scanned. Uh, so we can identify when weapons are coming to, to, to the territory through uh, the airport. Thank you. <coughs> All right, let's move on to economic development. And we've touched uh, mm -hmm. on it a little bit, but educational data reveal that reading proficiency at the end of third grade is a reliable predictor of student success in school as well as personal economic success as an adult. Unfortunately, according to data compiled by the Community Foundation of the VI in its annual publication, Kids Count, a large portion of VI third graders read well below expected grade level. What impact do you see this statistic as having on the future economic development of the VI? And what can you do as a senator to address the matter of reading proficiency in our schools? And we're gonna start with uh, Senator Nelson on this one. Thank you very much. Reading proficiency is essential, vital, to an individual having a successful life. I do believe the education system needs to focus on the basics, reading, writing, and arithmetic, especially at the elementary level. We are caught up with technology, we are caught up in putting computers in front of children, but you, if they can't read by the third grade, then that's not helping them. So I believe we need to focus on the core basic uh, education process. If we get back to the basics, we'll, we'll capture them, but I think we're filling up our curriculums with, with fancy topics, fancy subject matters. We're taking the resource personnel out of the school. So as a senator, what can we really do but provide appropriations to ensure that the Department of Education hire the resource personnel and, and have the appropriate equipment and supplement equipment and supplies to help students learn to read. But to me, it all comes down to a focus because again, the Department of Education is not focused on the basics anymore. Their training to testing, there's more emphasis on teacher preparation and, 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 and teacher development right now. And we've seen even the, the, the arts and all of the supplementary program, the extracurricular activities in the schools have been diminished because of funding while we see administrative personnel uh, up in management level continue to grow. What I would like to do is redistribute 
education resources where there are more resources going down to the classroom. So we have the personnel and the supplies and equipment to ensure that our children are in fact coming out of elementary school with a solid base. We, they've heard, the statistics have also said, if they can't read by third grade, they're likely to be in that pipeline headed to jail. If we're really serious about cutting off that pipeline, we will be very serious about ensuring that these children can read by uh, the third grade. And I think Kids Count need to change their name to Children Count because we also shouldn't refer to children as kids. I think our children can learn. I think Virgin Islands education system still works. The public school education still works. I believe we're just uh, distracted right now by trying to prepare for tests. Thank you. And I'd like to add to that uh, by saying that education has been a passion of mine for a long time. I served on the Board of Education and recognizing the limited authority that the board has, um, I, I decided to run for office. And I have introduced a number of measures uh, directed at improving education, uh, single gender education, charter schools uh, for the conversion of schools, uh, extended day learning, and even vouchers. I think that everything should be on the table. Our uh, the strength of our economy is determined by the strength of our workforce. And it's not a future problem, it's an existing problem. Commonly, we complain about individuals coming from away to take the jobs that should be filled by, by the residents of this territory. It is a reflection on our uh, education system. And across the country, what is happening is that universities are starting to change the way they prepare teachers so that they enter the classroom uh, with the ability to actually turn the lives of our children around. And if I can just add quickly, diversification of educational opportunities and to get away from the one-size-fits-all educational process is not going to work. And I support some of the initiatives being offered by my colleague. And, you know, I don't think charter school is all bad. Sticking with uh, economic development, in view of the audit findings of some significant failures in the loan programs of the EDA, a number of recommendations were made by the Inspector General to address these failures. What can the legislature do to ensure that the EDA acts on the re recommendations to correct these failures? And we're going to begin with you, Senator. Well, Ryan. you know, I wish that there was an opportunity for the legislature to put into the budget <clears throat> uh, requirements that if an agency fails to meet certain benchmarks and performance uh, matrices, that their budget will be reduced accordingly. And that that savings would then go to an agency that is in fact delivering uh, on, on their mandate. But that is not the reality that we live in. The reality that we live in is that the legislature many decades ago before my colleague and my time uh, allowed for the EDA to, to provide loans that were unsecure. No smart lending institution provides loans that are unsecured, meaning that if the person does not pay, you have absolutely nothing to attach and nothing to go after. Let's be honest. If the legislature did that, the legislature was wrong. And what the League of Women Voters and all other nonprofits should be doing is asking and demanding answers and names of people who owe money to the EDA. Because it is clear that it is even individuals who seek office. And so I am not going to sit here and try to hold the EDA accountable or responsible for something that clearly they were asked to do by the legislature. We have to be honest with each other. If we're seeking office because we want to do the right thing, or are we seeking office because we want to serve our own interest? Senator Nelson. The EDA loan program and the delinquency in the loans is just a derelict or neglect of, of that agency to perform its duties. I agree that the individuals who had outstanding balances were in prominent individuals in this community, and I believe it's just a matter of the EDA were unwilling to go after those individuals, and even up to this date have not exposed who those individuals are, in fact, who they are. So I believe, like any loan in, uh, institution, there are processes, there are debt-to-income ratio, there's a matter of making sure that you're going to have assets in case uh, the loan falters, that there's a way to collect. And that's within the EDA's authority to, to have conducted such and do such. So I'm not certain that there's new laws needed. It, they just need to follow their processes, and unfortunately no, no individual went to jail over this. But at some point we must just want honest government, and it starts with individuals operating from the heart, the right place. Okay. Thank you. Let's move on to waste management. 
Um, and this first question in this category is going to go to Senator Nelson. What could you do as a senator to address what is perceived by many to be the slow pace of the Waste Management Authority in developing and implementing plans to manage solid waste in the territory? A very interesting question. The Waste Management Authority needs to be restructured. The Waste Management Authority is supposed to be a regulatory board, a regulatory agency, but here's what happens. Currently, they also contract out. They are the ones who conduct contracting with the haulers. So how can you regulate yourself? How can you regulate your contracting these haulers? So we need to change the structure of waste management to make them purely regulatory. We need to put a sanit sanitation division back into public works, and then waste management can then oversee how the, these uh, different entities are getting rid of the waste. Uh, at some point, you've heard the discussion about a tipping fee, and we recently had to take a measure to stop the increase of these, uh, what we think was unreasonable uh, tipping fees, because some portion of our, to me, our property taxes should go into funding such an entity, and we have to let the, the concept of recycling sink into our community. We understand that even if we were to have some type of uh, facility that can in, uh, burn off this waste, the, the, the trash still needs to be separated, so we have to create a mindset in, across our entire territory that we, in order to be responsible citizens, we have to do better at managing our waste at home as well as what's taken to the various uh, uh, facilities. Another thing that I have a, a peeve about is that we have to make it accessible for people, citizens, to have places to get rid of their waste. Uh, with, the, with the places being closed early, with the places being closed on weekend, asking citizens to drive their regular vehicles down to the dump site, that's unacceptable. You have to have locations open and available for people to get rid of waste. And once a month, white goods collection is not good enough. That's why the waste end up in the, in the bush. I don't support that, but if, and if we're not making it available for us to get rid of our waste in a, in a, in a proper way, then you're going to have individuals, unfortunately, doing that. Thank you. At the risk of sounding like an idealist, um, the reality is that if we improve our education, our public education, um, we would be able to address many of the shortcomings that we are discussing. It's, it's really disgusting that people will even throw trash outside. Um, because uh, at the end of the day, this is your island. This is where you live. And we need to be able to, we need to have, take pride in, the, in, in our environment. Uh, we most recently last week passed a, a ban on plastic bags, uh, which I think is a, is a step in the right direction. Uh, the, the, the Waste Management Authority should be a regulatory uh, entity, and at this point I am so frustrated by, their, uh, in, by the level of inertia uh, that I believe that it's time to uh, dissolve them and allow for public works and other entities to, us to absorb uh, those activities uh, and, um, and to fund them at the levels necessary uh, to ensure that the haulers can haul a trash. Uh, but then you know, there are so many systems in place that, that provide for fines uh, that are not, um, by, to, some, to, a, to a great extent, are not being enforced. Okay, and thank you. I just want to add quickly that I agree. We must have a sense of pride in where we are, where we live, and, and choose to do better about it. And one concern I have about waste management is them pumping sewage beyond the reefs. Why do you think the reefs are being damaged besides the dirt? The sewage is doing it. Okay. Stick, sticking to that topic, um, Senator O'Reilly, what could you do as a senator to address what is perceived um, to be the conflict between economic development and the environment? Well, I think that clearly uh, we've talked for decades about a, a comprehensive land and water use plan. Uh, and about two years ago, uh, DPNR submitted to the legislature a, a, a huge document that, is, that comprises what they believe is the start uh, to ensuring that there is smart development uh, that considers the impact on the environment and our ecosystem. Unfortunately, that measure has not been considered on the, by the Committee of Jurisdiction. Uh, a lot of money went into recruiting Rutgers University uh, to, to develop this plan, and I think that's where we should start. Because it, 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 the plan includes 
a commentary, uh, and it, it also considers the concerns of the public, the public that has, that has already expressed why they would like to continue to have access to, the, to public beaches. Why is it that development that is too close to the water is damaging to our reefs and is damaging uh, to, to the fish and, and to the environment? Uh, so I believe that education is critical, but a, a comprehensive land and water use plan is going to be what will provide for us the, 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 in, the, the ability to make decisions regarding development in, in a smarter way. By way of example, any investor that is considering the territory uh, as a home for, for a hotel uh, would have to look at a comprehensive land and water use plan. And before property is identified, uh, they would know where that project can go. Uh, it will remove a lot of the rezoning requests from the legislature and all of the spot rezoning that you are seeing where you have residences uh, in a residential area. You might have a gas station or, or um, you know, uh, a, a landfill by way of example. And that's an extreme example because of the timer and the folder that he continues to put in my face. Uh, that would be, <laughs> that would be um, one way of addressing smart development uh, while we protect our environment. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Senator Nelson. Uh, there's always going to be a, a conflict uh, uh, with uh, development and, and environmental protection. But there's something called smart development where you contemplate your environment while you develop. I, I believe if we have proper regulation, even, even when you look at what the clearing that's happening in the rainforest, DPNR is supposed to monitor any clearing. When individuals are allowed to uh, push away guts where, water, where waterways flow and allow for the water to plain and, and do, do new flooding areas, those things create challenges and end up washing off uh, the dirt into the sea. So I believe with proper monitoring, uh, the, the, as, right, as it relates to the, the development itself, there's room for a lot of growth. Uh, we do want to have clean industries as possible. Some industries are just messy. There's nothing you can do to keep it totally clean, but there are safeguards that you can ensure to protect your air and water. You have to remember this. We only have one environment. The air we breathe, the water we drink. It's very essential to our vitality. Okay. Let's move on to health care. It was recently suggested that the legislature should pass laws that would allow the Governor Juan F. Louis Hospital to enter into for-profit public-private partnerships. What would be your position on for-profit ventures by our public hospitals? What are the benefits and what are the dangers? And we're going to start this time with Senator Nelson. <laughs> There's pros and cons in, in anything. My concern with a for-profit health facility is exactly that. It's for-profit. Individuals might be subjected to uh, operations that are not necessary, to medication that are not necessary. Uh, uh, what you might have, however, is better efficiency because there's a, there's a bottom line that you have to meet. Uh, how something like that is structured, I'll have to see before I can give you what my position would be. I, I do support the hospital being uh, the structure that it currently is. Uh, I appreciate it being the way it is for our sake because we have a lot of poverty here. However, I do believe at some point we have to ensure that we have the, the, the right, uh, I guess, collaboration of, of health facilities, uh, medical professionals, so that our populace feels that we have a health system that can take care of them from birth to the grave, that uh, we have to ensure that. Uh, so uh, whatever collaboration we can pursue, I'm open to, but exactly how they're structured is going to determine whether or not I'm, I'm supportive because I do understand and I'm concerned with individuals being turned away from healthcare services. Even right now, uh, 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 individuals who are an MAP, et cetera, do not have access to the doctor. They have to be in long waiting lines and needing emergency uh, operations but are being told to wait six months, eight months, a year. That cannot work. So whatever we do, I support a healthcare system that can accommodate our health needs from the uh, cradle to the grave. Thank you. I believe that our healthcare system can also be an economic um, engine 
for the territory. And it's clear that the, the hospitals are not able to function and be sustainable under the, the, the matrix that they, that they, that they function under. Uh, so I support uh, the collaboration and partnering with uh, for-profit groups that are going to be able to shore up the hospital uh, services. Uh, and there are ways for us to control to make sure that there is no abuse. Uh, I also support a private hospital. I believe that through a certificate of need that has to be issued through the Department of Health, uh, we can make sure that there are measures and that there are uh, conditions within that certificate of needs uh, that guarantees that there will be care for the uninsured, uh, that ensures that those doctors in that private hospital also provide services in our public uh, hospitals. They, I think that the, the, we can create a synergy that works for everyone because at the end of the day, if we improve our healthcare system, we can then market ourselves to retirees across the world to come to the Virgin Islands and, um, and to contribute to our community. And I see us being able to capitalize on being a, a regional uh, a area for individuals in the Caribbean who can come to the Virgin Islands for health care. Staying on health care, and um, this question is going to be directed at Senator O'Reilly. Mm -hmm. What kind of additional legislation can be passed to protect the rights of patients with mental illness? Well, you know, a and <laughs> in what areas can legislation be passed to improve the quality of life for the uh, for mental health of consumers and their caregivers? Sure, sure. Uh, that's an excellent question. As you know, the governor just recently issued an executive order uh, that is going to allow for the government to hire psychiatrists and other mental health care providers uh, outside of the limitations that are inherent in the statute. Uh, and I think that's really uh, of, of great uh, significance uh, to us, particularly since last week during session, we were able to pass two measures uh, that allow for the 722, which is the emergency commitment, and also the involuntary commitment uh, laws to be changed so that families of individuals with mental illness are able to access care for them for a longer period of time uh, and doctors are able to provide the, the care and the, and, the, and the prescriptions needed to stabilize the patient. What we have to do more broadly, and I think and there is a real urgency in doing this, is to uh, provide the facilities for there to be a more comprehensive mental health care uh, a system uh, like an, which would include inpatient, outpatient, counseling, assistance to families, uh, and, um, and the ability for our mental health uh, patients to get the care that they need through a continuum care um, uh, process. And I think that is something that we are in discussion. A few years ago, the legislature uh, transferred 10 acres of property to a, a local nonprofit, uh, and, it, and it is property that the Attorney General has been uh, working on to build a mental health facility. Uh, and that means millions of dollars returning to the territory because currently we house all of these individuals uh, filing. And so that would also help, our, help our, our budget and create jobs. So if we are able to repeal the transfer of that land and repurpose that property for a mental health care facility, we will be uh, doing a great service for both mental health patients and their families. Thank you. Nelson. About every other Caribbean destination in the Caribbean, Caribbean island in this region, has a long-term mental health facility. Uh, we need to catch up. We, it's important that we understand if you have a facility where long-term care, where monitoring, where proper medication can be applied, some of these individuals can actually be restored. But when they're left to their own uh, to be uh, medicated and released out in the streets where families are ignoring them, you're going to have that. So I think we need to have a level of pride in wanting to take care for those individuals with mental illness. And families themselves must not be too, prior, too proud of themselves to come forward and acknowledge when a, a family member does in fact have mental illness and is in need of help. Too many times that individual is just sort of overlooked, slide away, hidden away in the closet until that individual is now grown and is in a worse situation. So I do support the, uh, the rights of, of individual with mental illness. We, right, we are, right now we're under a consent decree as well. Mm -hmm. So it's about time we get stepped in with that as well. That can provide Thank uh, you. economics. Thank you. 
Okay. And I don't think we can forget mental, mental illness and the connection to substance abuse, including alcohol. And I think it's critical that whatever discussion we're having will include a, a component that will address uh, substance abuse as well. Okay. Well, I do agree with better facilities, we can to have a more holistic approach to, to uh, addressing this. Okay, Senator um, Nelson, what can you do as a senator to address the costly burden placed on our hospitals as they are pressed to care for the uninsured? The costly burden of taking care of the indigent, the uninsured. At, at some point, uh, I appreciate that status, okay? But at, at some point, uh, I think we must find a source to supplement the hospital in order so that they can help to, uh, I guess, support their budget in providing these needs. But uh, my bigger concern is the fact that there are so many working people here in the territory who are, in fact, uninsured, and we need to see if we can have, even if it's the GERS or some entity that can sponsor uh, 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 an insurance program for private sector. Too many private individuals, too many private employers, employees go without insurance, go without any type of retirement. Individuals are willing to work hard up until they're unable to, and then when they're unable to, they just expect it to just dwindle away with their last paycheck and have nothing to look towards. So there's an initiative that I've worked on, I'm trying to look at the GERS, when we pass a resolution to have them do a study, a feasibility study, to see if we can in fact create a Virgin Islands Employees Retirement System and under that see if we could capture some sort of Virgin Islands employers, employees healthcare system which it will be cheaper because you have a bigger pool of individuals and they can have some level of coverage but it's important to get to the fact that the health of our community, even those who are unable to pay for insurance has to be provided some kind of way. And I'm going to tell you, in most industrialized nations, health care is paid for by all of the working people of those nations because health care is rolled into your taxes and thus health care and education is taken care of. So as an American territory and as America altogether, we need to start to rethink how we're providing certain services to our populace. And I'm talking about our country and the whole, not even just the Virgin Islands. Okay. Yeah, I believe that greed has a lot to do with the fact mm -hmm. that we have um, a number of employers that are not providing health insurance for our employees. Uh, currently, the law only mandates that EDC beneficiaries provide health insurance. In the meantime, uh, they are employers who, who, who do not. Uh, there are a couple of things happening currently, like the expansion in Medicaid uh, that now allows for single people to come on board, for, mother, for, for pregnant women to come on board, for the elderly to come on board. Uh, and the hospitals and Department of Human Services, they need to be able to, to collaborate better so that as individuals go into the emergency room uh, or go into the hospital for services, that we get them what is called the presumptive eligibility piece. And that way there would be reimbursement uh, to the hospital. But at the end of the day, we need to encourage employers uh, to do the right thing. Uh, and we need to have the banking and insurance office uh, just go out and solicit insurance companies who would be willing to come to the territory to offer, to the territory to offer health insurance. Because, at, because that is really the, the answer. Thank Limited. you. Okay. We need to talk a little bit about GERS. GERS recently made public the fact that it has only until 2023 worth of cash to pay annuities. What legislation can you propose to keep GERS from becoming completely insolvent? And we'll start with you. Sure. Uh, th so there is no legislation that I can pass or the Senate can pass that is going to prevent the insolvency of the GERS. I'm going to be honest. Uh, the, the, we passed some uh, GRS reform last year. I think that, that began to help to stop the bleeding. Uh, and also the $100 million bond authorization that we just approved in the session last week is going to help the GRS. It is not going to fix the problem. It is simply going to delay the inevitable. I believe that the GRS, that it's time for us to consider real reform. And that real reform isn't going to... Uh, it's not going to bode well with many people. I believe that we need to bifurcate the GRS. We need to divide Tier 1 employees and Tier 2 employees. Tier 1 employees can remain, and the government will have to fund 
that those retirees until the last retiree retires from the earth, and that's going to be somewhere in 2040. Uh, in the meantime, the tier two employees, we need to figure out what the cash value of their contribution is with some uh, estimation of, of return on whatever their contribution has been. And we need to be able to write them a check and say, here, uh, you now can choose to go join another plan uh, and, and let your money grow for you to ensure your retirement. Clearly, the GRS uh, program is a very attractive and very generous uh, a pension system that was created many years ago without consideration for the financial burden that it would have uh, on the government and the inability of this government to sustain it. And then finally, legislatures of the past have passed unfunded mandates that authorized early retirement for many people that did not include funding. That is the truth. Thank you. Senator Nelson. Uh, GRS has become a complex issue. And the real fixes to the GRS is going to entail changing the ratio of active employees and retired employees. So you have to increase the payroll. How do you do that and be in this crunch? Well, you have to redistribute government resources. A lot of those contracted employees need to become employees of the government so you can build up the payroll. There's a measure that was spoken about years ago, and we still have not made that adjustment. Calculation of annuities has to be on the total average of your whole career, not on your last five years. That's a cheat for the system because you are being calculated at your highest levels when your history, those other 25 years or 20 years or 15 or whatever it was, does not say that you should be at that rate. So that is a cheat to the system. So I, I and likewise, as it increased the enrollees in GERS, if you were to Think about an expansion where the GERS sponsors of Virgin Islands Employees Retirement System, where private employers and employees can now participate in this system. You have more people paying in, and we have to be responsible in how we lend and use that money. I believe that another option on the table should be uh, transferring from defined benefits to defined contributions, and that's, that's why I said it's not going to bode well for many people. I believe that uh, if we all recognize that the, this is a calamity, that we are on the cliff, and if we want to avoid that fall, we're all going to have to accept a sacrifice. Okay. Moving on to energy, Senator Nelson, what ideas would you put forward as a senator to pay for street lighting? <laughs> street lighting should be paid for out of our property taxes. Listen, property taxes shouldn't just be dumped into the general fund. Your, your sewage, your, your, your waste, your street lights, some of those basic infrastructure is why we pay property taxes. These things that we're asking for shouldn't be favors that a senator grant you. We pay taxes for these things. So <laughs> there's really no legislation that needs to happen. We just need to apply our, our, our monies appropriately. But what we need to do as it relates to affording electricity altogether, we need to build a new power plant, two of them. We need to build a modern power plant in the appropriate location. It need not need to be in that densely populated downtown it was a bad idea to put uh, propane tanks at that size in the middle of downtown Christiansted. It is still a bad idea. It should be on the south side, closer to the Renaissance property. For me, we need to acquire the Renaissance property, build a modernized WAPA public utility. Yeah, I would, I would en entertain a public-private partnership for the construction and the operation until they're paid back, but I'm for a public utility that utilizes the multiple sources available as it relates to energy right now. With the smart grids available, they don't, all of the energy production does not have to be in one location. And at that south shore next to Renaissance, you'll be able to pipe the methane gas from the dump to burn off as well, so we can also do something about the waste all at the same time. So I believe we need to make energy affordable, and the street lighting would be the least of our worries. But un until we, we decide to make up our mind and take off these band-aids and fix the plan, a modernized plan, make that investment, we'll continue to be having these challenges. Like right now, the, the, the potable water is dirty. It makes no sense to change all of those pipes and run it back to the same uh, location. I think all of this needs to be considered as we think about our infrastructure. Thank you. And I'd like to add, I'd like to add very quickly that um, Senator Nelson actually ha ha articulates one of the most comprehensive uh, uh, manners in which we should address our, uh, our energy pro um, issue. I believe making energy affordable is critical. 4% of our property taxes currently goes to lighting. It's not enough. 
Um, so I really support a privatization of our electrical company. A utility company should be privatized. And yes, perhaps um, some, some contractual obligation to purchase it back once their investments uh, are paid back. Thank you. <laughs> All right. We're, I invite you now to take the opportunity to address any other topic of concern that we have not addressed in the discussion or to expand on any topic we did discuss. One minute and we will begin with Senator O'Reilly. Sure, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to really spend some more time talking about health care. I, I believe that, um, that there are so many competing issues that we are all constantly uh, asked to address, but at the end of the day, health care is, is really perhaps one of the most significant because all of us, at one point or another, will be using our hospitals. And so it's essential for individuals to understand that if you have insurance, you should so inform the hospital when you use the services. It's critical for the health, uh, the health clinics to work together with the hospitals so that individuals who have uh, medical emergencies that are not really life-threatening can use the clinics instead of the emergency room. And I think it's also uh, essential for people to volunteer to help to help in the hospitals. Uh, we are going to have to look at healthcare as one of the most significant issues confronting this territory and also to address it and, and, and consider the potential that it has for economic uh, development and growth. Thank you. Senator Nelson, one minute. Uh, for me, I, w I really want for us, when we talk about infrastructure, to understand what we're saying. There is energy infrastructure, there's transportation infrastructure, there's healthcare infrastructure, there's education infrastructure, you name it. So if we think about our infrastructure and how it has to be shored up, transportation, for example, the conditions of our roads, the lack of transportation or the affordable transportation between our islands, we are one territory, those things should, we should work on because you're impeding commerce, you're, you're holding back travel of individuals and goods from going back and forth. If you understand economics of moving people and goods back and forth, if those are challenged, then you can see why we're having a challenging economy. All right? I'm also very interested in us ensuring that we approach crime from three levels. First, from providing opportunities, alternatives, and then enforcement. We can't think that enforcement alone is gonna stop crime. Opportunities, opportunities for education and entrepreneurship jobs, et cetera. Thank you. We have come to the end of today's forum and each candidate will now have 60 seconds to close, beginning with Senator Nelson. I want to thank the League of Women Voters once again and WTGX for having me here. I want to remind the people that I have been your public servant since returning home in 1995. I've been before you, and I came before you in 2004 asking for your vote. You said yes. You said yes five other times. I'm asking you to say yes again. I still have fight in me. I still have a vision for St. Croix. I still have a heart for the people. I'm asking to be one of your representatives in the 32nd legislature. Critical times need critical thinkers. I offer myself as such. Positive T.A. Nelson, a man with a plan, a man with vision, a man with the courage to do what is right. Not because it's convenient, but because it's necessary. I ask for your continued support, your prayers, and your vote. I still believe in the Virgin Islands. I'm not going anywhere. This is home for me. We have to be able to live here, and I believe with myself and others that can support the vision, we can get there. I thank you once again. May God bless us all. Senator O'Reilly. Sure. Um, the Virgin Islands should be, uh, ought to be a beacon of hope for the Caribbean and for the world. We are a small community of 100,000 people. There is no reason why we should continue to be challenged by the same problems. In 2009, when you uh, allowed me to serve you as a senator. I promised that I would stay true to myself and to my beliefs and that I will keep my promises and I believe that I have worked very hard for the people of St. Croix. I believe that I have represented St. Croix fearlessly. I believe that I bring experience, I bring uh, excellent work ethic, and I bring with me the level of compassion that we need to address the issues that are confronting our community on a daily basis. I ask you to consider returning me to the 32nd legislature so that I can continue to work on your behalf uh, with the team of senators that we have now that have really shown uh, to have a heart uh, for the people, for St. Croix and for our constituents. I am number 12 on the ballot. 
I ask all of you to come out and vote on November 8th because remember, voting is your right. Thank you. Thank you, candidates, for being here for this forum. And thank you, WTJX. Please continue to view all of our programs, which will be aired on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 9 p.m., with a re-air on Saturday at 4 p.m. and Sundays at 4 and 5 p.m. as we interview candidates on both St. Croix and St. Thomas. Be sure you are registered to vote your vote does count. In the VI, where our numbers are relatively small, one vote can make a big difference. Remember, your vote determines the kind of government we will have. And do consider joining the League of Women Voters, which is open to both men and women members. Thank you and see you at the polls.